you got a seminary level of teaching from the Old Testament as, as it pertains to the New Testament. And it was very, very good. Well, you're going to get a little bit more of that today. I'm on a to-be-continued part of that I mentioned last week. I said my message would be continued. Well, yeah, that's what I'm doing today. We're continuing on through the, uh, a long-term series in Matthew. So we're going to be at this a while. And my, my text today is Matthew 1, 18 to 25, a very familiar verse to most of us. It starts out with a statement. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And then it goes into a problem that occurred during the engagement of Mary to Joseph. We know that Mary is the mother of Jesus, the Christ, who is the Son of God. We tend to think of Christ as a surname for Jesus, Jesus Christ, John Jones, or whatever, but that's not really true. Christ is a title. It's a title that is given to Jesus. It means anointed. In Hebrew, it would be Messiah, which means the anointed one. Matter of fact, John explains that in John 1, 40 to 41. He says, one of John the Baptist's disciples who started following Jesus, whose name was Andrew, went and found his brother Simon. And he said to him, we have found the Messiah. You know, that's a, that's a line we can use. And when we're telling people about Jesus, we have found the Messiah. We have found Jesus, which means Christ. Engagements between couples were handled a lot differently. And I'm, I might step on some toes today, and I'm going to freely admit that. Your toes might, might feel a little painful today because I'm going to go against the culture that we experience in our, in our society today. The engagement could last as long as 12 to 18 months. That's really not all that uncommon today, even. What is so unusual is how the engagement happened in Bible times. The father of the groom would approach the father of the bride and ask for his daughter's hand in marriage for his son. If this was agreeable, a dowry was paid, a contract of marriage was drawn up, and signed, which could be broken only if one or the other, one or both parties were unfaithful. There was no premarital sex going on. There was no living together before the marriage. They were considered married, but they had not come together as a married couple. The woman, more than likely, like Mary, was a virgin. If she was not, it would have been very difficult for her to find a husband. Such was the case for Mary. When she and Joseph were engaged, she was a virgin. If the contract was broken, there were severe penalties that could happen. One of the worst would be death by stoning. It was prescribed in the Mosaic Law. Not just the woman or the man, but both. At the very least, public shaming and disgrace. A certificate of divorce was written and a dowry was forfeited. Joseph likely would have built a room on his father's house if he was still alive at that time. And when the wedding ceremony came, she went, he went and picked up his bride and took her to his father's house. If you read John 14, 1 to 4, it's very descriptive. Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. And I will come again to receive you, the church, my bride, for himself. If Joseph's father was already passed, he would have built some sort of dwelling for them to live in. After all, he was a carpenter, no problem. I have performed a couple weddings for couples who are still virgins and not living together, but that is so extremely rare today. It used to be the exception, but now it is not. It used to be the exception that couples were living together. Now it is not. I would say 95 to 99% of couples are, are living together before marriage. One of our future candidates, well, all of our future candidates for president were recently asked what they thought was the greatest threat to our country. I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again because it fits. 
All but one said climate change. All but one. The other candidate said she felt the most, while climate change was important, that she felt Iran was the greatest threat to our country. I know what the biggest threat to our country is, or at least in my opinion. It's a lack of strong moral Christian values and a failure of, and, and a failure of our country to eliminate abortion and overturn Roe versus Wade. The devil is busy destroying the very fabric of our society through our families. He's been working overtime. It's a failure of the United States Supreme Court and lower courts to uphold the Constitution of the United States, which abortion is a constitutional issue. They are denied the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Think what 60 million babies, if they have been allowed to live, the contribution they could make to our society. If Just think if we would follow the word of God, if we would turn back as a nation to following the word of God, what a difference it would make in 10 years. What kind of difference it's made in turning away from the word of God in 10 years? Matter of fact, the last two months. I can hardly believe how far down the road we have gone in our society in the last two months. In Bible times, marriage was for the most part binding for life, not that there weren't divorces. Jesus got on the Pharisees who would allow divorce for any reason. If they burned the lamb chops or roast a goat too many times, they would grant the divorce. In Matthew 19, 3 through 8, we read, some of the Pharisees came to test him, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce a wife for any and every reason? They would allow that. Jesus replied, have you not read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So then, they asked him, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? And I tell this pre-married couples, you know, when they come to me for premarital counseling before marriage, it's because of your hardness of heart that Moses permitted divorce. Hardness of heart, Jesus said. I told you I'm going to step on some toes. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not that way from the beginning. Marriage was designed by God to last a lifetime. I watched a news story on TV last Friday night. It was kind of interesting. It was about a couple who will celebrate 77 years of marriage. Tomorrow night will be their 77th wedding anniversary. They are 97 and 98 years old, and they still love each other very much. When they said, I do, they meant it. So back to our scripture. Joseph and Mary were engaged. The contract was signed. But before the wedding could take place, Mary is found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. So I entitled this message, Promise Made, Promise Kept. For, I said that, I did that for a couple reasons. First of all, marriage did, and Mary did not break her engagement promise to Joseph. She did not break it. She was still a virgin. Despite being pregnant. Well, how is that possible? Well, she was, her baby was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. When she agreed to be the mother of our Lord, she knew the implications and how her husband might, future husband might react. She knew this pregnancy could have implications, but every Jewish girl dreamed about fulfilling that role that Mary did. Also, she knew, and I think we can hang our head on this one, she knew that if the Lord brought this about, he would cover the details with Joseph, which he did. But there's even a bigger promise that has been kept, as mentioned in these scriptures, in verses 22 to 23. It was made 650 years earlier through Isaiah the prophet. And the same promise that 
Jason mentioned this morning during our Sunday school are made to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Several millennia before that. It doesn't matter how long ago the Lord makes a promise. That promise will be good until he fulfills it. And he will fulfill it in his time, not in ours. The scripture reads, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Isaiah 7, 14. Well, you know, this is ad-libbing, and it's dangerous to ad-lib or add stuff to the Bible. I'm not trying to add words to the Bible, but you can imagine Joseph's reaction to Mary when she tells her, he pleads with him to understand what happened to her. Oh, okay, Mary, yeah. Right, conceived by the Holy Spirit, you say. Oh, okay. I don't know if I can buy that one. The Bible doesn't tell us the conversation that Mary and Joseph had, but it does tell us Joseph's character. The character of this man is exemplary. Her husband, her husband Joseph, being a just and righteous man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. In our society today, this is the difference. Nothing much would have been thought about this. Joseph and Mary more than likely would have already been living together for a couple years. They would have bought a house and a car and had sexual relations. He would have just thought the baby was his. End of story. It happens like that every day. As I said, if God planned this, he would work out the details. As Joseph was considering his next course of action, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear, her, bear a son. He shall call his name Jesus. And listen to these next words. For he will save his people from their sins. Here through Joseph and Mary, God is going to fulfill our greatest need. Now, if you were to ask people today what their greatest need is, what do you think you might hear? Well, I've got some ideas. Perhaps a different house where the roof doesn't leak. More money to catch up on bills or go on vacation. A different car that doesn't break down all the time. This time of year, they might say college t tuition money. I need money to pay my kids college tuition money. Or enough money to retire uncomfortably. The, uh, the list could go on. As important as these needs are, they are not our greatest need. Our greatest need is for a Savior to save us from our sins. That's your greatest need. No matter what other needs you have, they are secondary to that. This will affect your eternal future. It is interesting to note that even before Jesus was born, prophecies about him were being already fulfilled. Bible scholars vary in their opinions about the number of prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus that were in the Old Testament, ranged from 300 to 450 prophecies. Everyone had to be fulfilled or Jesus could not be the Christ. It has been said that the likelihood of all the prophecies concerning Jesus being fulfilled is like covering the whole state of Texas a foot deep with silver dollars and then marking one, blindfolding that man, a man, and sending him out in the state, and he pick up the, the Mark Silver dollar on the first try. Something like 10 to the 70th power. I don't know if that's accurate, but it's, you put a lot of zeros beyond the 10. Yet Jesus fulfilled every one perfectly, even until the very moment before he died on a cross. If he did not, he would not be the Christ. He would not be the Messiah. What conclusion can we bring from that? The conclusion we can bring from that is the Bible is true. It's without error. It's reliable in everything that it teaches. We can believe it. So did Joseph believe the word that the angel gave him? Yes. 
And he proved it by his actions. Verse 25. When he woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, but he didn't know her until he had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. He didn't know her. Jesus had to be born of a virgin to fulfill the prophecy. Some church traditions that consider Mary as also being born without sin by special grace of God, which is the doctrine of immaculate conception. There is no biblical mandate for that, no biblical substantiation for this. They try to answer the question, how could Jesus with a human mother, a normal human mother, and God as his father, still be born without sin? Sin was passed on from the father. We get into trouble when we do like I did, try to ad lib and add to the Bible things that aren't in the Bible and answer questions the Bible doesn't answer. The Bible doesn't answer all of our questions, but it gives us enough. Like John 10, verse uh, 30, I think, no, John 20, verse 30, it says, not everything that has been written about Jesus is included in his work, but these have been included so you may believe and know that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the time we must take by faith what the Bible says without adding anything to it. Now, lots of questions have been posed about the temptation of Jesus. I've got about five minutes left here, so bear with me. Lots of questions have been posed about the temptation of Jesus. Was the temptation real? If he was the son of God, which he is, was the temptation real for him? Hebrews 4 says he was tempted in all things as we are, and yet without sin. During the 30 days in the wilderness, I believe he was hit with every temptation has ever been known to mankind, not just the three that were mentioned. And he passed every test. But it was not his nature to disobey God, his father. The temptations were real, but it was not his nature to disobey his father. But the temptations had a much deeper meaning. It served in a legal sense to prove that Jesus was truly without sin. Where Adam failed the test in the garden, Jesus passed the test. He had to pass all the temptations that the devil threw at him, or he'd just been another sinful man dying on a cross, of which there were thousands in a Roman Empire. Only one was able to pay for our sins in full is our perfect representative. That one is Jesus, who died for our sins. When Peter and John, I'm going to conclude with this statement. When Peter and John stood before the Jewish council and they were on trial for the Jewish council, how they had healed this man who was lame from birth. And they were on trial to explain why they were preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. And they, they gave a clear statement that flies in the face of, of teaching in our churches and society today is that there's many ways to the same God. There's many ways to the same, to the Father. You can believe whatever you want and you'll still be okay. No, that isn't what they said. There was lots of false teaching in Paul in uh, Peter and John's day. There were lots of idols being worshipped. There were lots of false teachers out there. Even Judaism came against them. Oh, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you've got to be circumcised. You've got to follow the law. Paul said, if you try and follow the law, you're going to die by the law. There is no grace in the law. But Peter and John gave clear testimony concerning Jesus in Acts 4.12. I'll conclude with this. I think this is the third time now. Preachers can say I'm concluding three times. There's salvation in no one else. For there's no, under, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
no other name than the name of Jesus by which we must be saved. They were witnesses of, of, of resurrected Christ. They saw him in person. No other name. Father, we thank you for the examples that are left in the Bible for us in, in Mary and Joseph and the righteousness, righteous man that he was and, and how you brought about this miraculous conception of a child being born to a virgin. A child being born who was the sinless son of God. A child being born who would eventually take all of our sins upon himself and go to the cross with them and bear our sins upon the cross, being accursed for us. So the curse of sin and death would be removed from everyone who believes in your name. And that's what is all wrapped up in this scripture, these few verses, that Jesus came to save his people from their sins. He came to save us by taking the curse of death upon himself so we could have freedom, gift of eternal life in a relationship with a loving Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for doing that for us. In precious name, amen.